Hello, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another Harkness Screens. Well, it's not a round table per se, because it's a smaller round table. This is probably be more of a conversation around a stool more than anything else, to be honest. Uh, I'm joined by Tony Dilley to discuss various different aspects of his work with Harkness Screens, as well as CEO Mark Ashcroft. Uh, Tony, how are things? Yeah, not bad, considering the, uh, the state the world's in generally, particularly <laughs> as far as our industry is concerned. But yeah, we're... we're um, we're 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 bubbling along. It, it's difficult out there. Um, if we were only in one territory, we would be struggling. But because we've got factories globally, it, it, it seems to be that while one's quiet, another one's busy. So yeah, we're bubbling along. Yeah, and we'll get we'll be moving on to the complexities of of different areas and, and yeah. how things are going in different countries there. But obviously, Mark Ashcroft is with us as well. Mark, how how are things with you? Very well, thank you. Yes, um, as Tony says, our industry is having its moments with uh, the pandemic. We, um, you know, we really feel for our cinema customers not being able to open their movie theatres in so many countries of the world. It's it's heartbreaking and we've attempted and will continue to keep our factories open to help in any way we can. And, you know, we want to get talking to our customers. Yeah, and, and before we started recording, we were talking about kind of getting out there and talking to people, which obviously isn't really a possible thing to do at the minute because of, well, I think everyone knows the reason. Um, yeah. And the, <laughs> I think everyone knows the reason. And it's been banged, you know, against the door, I think, for the past 10 months in particular. But discussing one of the key areas that you guys are actually able to, to, to talk to customers, to know their needs and actually get to know them even better is probably trade shows. And the nature of trade shows, it's face to face. It's in a confined space generally. Um, and as a result of that and COVID-19, they're not able to take place at the moment. Um, but Tony, I believe you're doing something rather, rather kind of ingenious at the minute in terms of doing virtual trade shows in order to still get some sort of face time, although albeit not the face time you're probably used to with some of Harkness's customers. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I, I really enjoy doing shows. A lot of people don't like doing them, but I, I, I love doing shows and I love customer visits. It, it, it's, it's what I'm good at. And uh, it is good to see customers, but we can't at the moment. So we're doing our second virtual trade show of Expo Cine um, in Brazil. The first one was a trade show. It was a virtual trade show, people at the show asking questions, various things. This one's a technical presentation over a couple of days. It, it, from our point of view, it's getting life back into cinema from the point of view of what the customers should be doing when they open the cinema. And once the cinema op is open, how to improve presentation and make sure you get people going back to the cinema. Because everybody's been looking that little, watching that little flat thing in the corner for the last year, 18 months. So, you know, we've got to get them back in front of the big screen. Has there been a lot of interest in terms of, has there been plenty of people hopping onto these kind of I imagine there are Teams call or a Zoom call. Are, are there plenty of people jumping on these? Well, yeah. I mean, there's been lots of different ones. Unic have been doing some, which is the European Cinema Union, and they've been doing them with Celluloid Junkie, which is, I don't know, what would you call Celluloid Junkie, Mark? What? Uh, it's, it's really a, a cinema industry news portal. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, it's, it's, very uh, very well received yeah and a couple of guys that run it um patrick and sperling are really um really interesting characters and keep us up to date with lots of industry news yeah they've, they've been doing them regularly and they've covered all aspects everything from advertising concessions what they're going to do when they reopen the cinemas you know the whole gambit they've covered everything over the last since last what march april time and they've been good and box office have been running some so there's been plenty of them you know i think there's been and there's been a lot of interest in the things that they've been doing 
And obviously, you mentioned there you're, you're currently doing one that's, well, it, technically it's hosted in Brazil, isn't it? But obviously, I imagine people are far flung and, and far from the beaches of Rio de Janeiro. It, 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 will, be, it will be mainly Latin America. Um, and they, simul, they simultaneously translate it, uh, Spanish and English. And is, is that one of the key things you're having to do? Because I know that you deal with the South American, the, the Latin American market quite quite a lot. I think our first kind of interaction was when you were, I think you were out in Brazil, actually, now I'm thinking about it. Uh, yeah. But um, obviously you, you're talking about that. And obviously there's everywhere has got different complexities when it comes to COVID-19 in terms of what facilities are open, what facilities are closed. Is that, is that a difficult part of it, trying to get your head around all these different markets and what they're actually dealing with at the minute? Yeah, I think I think the thing is going to be the openings. I think I mean Europe tends to be looking April May at the moment. If you look at most of the countries, they're looking at April and May. Mexico, Brazil, Argentina, they've got some cinemas opening open, but it's only the big ones in shopping malls. When they will open with a country as or the entire country will open, that's that, that's a different matter. That's we really don't know how far that is down the avenue. And it's a tough one, Joe, in people that Tony knows that I know that are based out in Latin America. They're, um, they're very keen to get things moving again, but the infection levels and the death, death rates are so high it really does make these these decisions difficult and i was talking recently to to a, a former colleague of mine who's based in brazil and he was telling me just how apprehensive he's become as a result of the um the, the new variant outbreak in manos and the fact that that seems to be in infecting people for a second time hitting a lot younger people um so tony's right you know making the decision on reopening in those markets is is incredibly difficult for people whether it's politicians whether it's business owners or whether it's the public in general it's it's a difficult time i think do you feel as though mark that we were talking a lot of the minute, in, especially in the UK in particular, about vaccination rollout, things like that. Do you think, because we're, everything we're basing projections off at the minute is based on vaccination rate in the country. Is that is that the key decider, do we feel, to, to when, in particular in the UK and, you know, Ireland? Do we think that's probably a key indicator as to when cinema may reopen and will be allowed to reopen? Because on the whole, the idea is that the world we live in will be safer. I've been impressed so far with the ability of the UK to roll out the vaccine um, and I'm delighted for the folk in the NHS that not only are they confronted with the, the level of hospitalisation and they're coping with that, I'm also really delighted for them that you see them actually smiling as they're they're handing out the injection. I think from a country's, from our country's perspective, that's a, a wonderful thing to see. In terms of, I, I believe vaccination and boosters are going to be part of our future. However, we really do need to continue to acknowledge the need for COVID secure venues. And that's what cinemas have done so well. And I, I have a real problem that they don't get the, the pat on the back for having done it so well. To the best of my knowledge, and I think Tony will maybe know better than me, there haven't been any recorded cases of COVID coming out of people being in the cinema watching a movie. That's and, yeah. you know, they're safe places to be. And yet, the moment there's a lockdown, they're the first place to get closed down and it just feels incredibly unfair to me and I would you know I would consider that for the next few years there'll be a, a blend of vaccination 
and I'll call them COVID countermeasures, whether that's, you know, whether that's a mask or whether that's two foot or four foot or six foot apart, we're going to have to have a level of COVID countermeasures. And I really believe that cinemas understand that and can do it better than anybody. Yeah, I think it'll be, I think once we get into what you would call the the autumn jabs, like we have the regular flu jabs at the moment in autumn, when you get that second inoculation or whatever. I think once we get round to that sort of period, then we might see, I think we'll see cinemas opening April, May, June would be my guess. Um, in the UK or in Europe in general, it'll be phased. Um, and then I think we have restrictions and they will be lifted slowly. It'll be 30 or 40 percent, then it'll go up to 50, etc. And and does it feel kind of after what's been a pretty uh how should we say this challenging 10 months? Does it feel like there is certainly a different outlook at this stage, given that you know we are actually able to talk about these things and, and kind of have a bit more certainty about the words that we use and, and how, how we're kind of going around day-to-day -day business at, at present? Yeah, I think the, the problem is we don't know what the operators are going to do. The operators have been starved of major income for the last 12 months, well, whatever it is coming up to 12 months. Um, so they haven't got a war chest. They, they've got to start building that back up. Um, there will be projects going on, uh, contracts that they've signed, where they've got to go and build a new multiplex. I think there'll be closures. I think there may be some more takeovers, a bit more consolidation. Um, although saying that, the consolidation to someone like AMC and Cineworld has not done them a favour because they had so many cinemas. Um, so it's going to be an interesting, an interesting market for the first year, 18 months of, of reopening. And, and I think what? Joe, just adds to Tony's comment there, that that's why, you know, traditionally trade shows have been so important to to Tony and myself, because you can really start to understand what the forward looking projections are from the operators. So, you know, in previous years, Tony, we'd have we'd have been in Las Vegas in March, we'd have been in Barcelona in June, we'd have headed over to Dubai in October and Hong Kong in December. And, you know, those four visits were really allow us to to plan going forward wouldn't they yeah yep uh, at the moment it, it, it's project delay at the moment i mean we, we get some good signs of places like uh saudi arabia is open saudi arabia at the moment is it, it's fallen back a little bit but it is continuing to do the business um dubai is open to some degree although they have got a bit of a problem again with infection rates climbing, so they may well start to shut their cinemas again. So, yeah, it, that's the problem. You, you, you can't say that that is now open. And Tony, do you think the um, Cine Europe will go ahead this year? I think it's... It, it, I've got a feeling it will go ahead in some sort of form. The big problem is if the Americans can come over. You could be... Although it's a European show, it relies heavily on American films being shown there for the film bookers. Um, as you know, there might be there might be seven or eight thousand people at the show, but you only see fifteen hundred of those go round the technical aspects of it. They actually come round and look at your goods, go you know, and look at projectors. So the technical people, and there's four four thousand other people that only go into the cinema and talk about booking films. So I think that's going to be the balance. How many Americans are liable to come over? What films are going to be shown? You know, what, how many films are there that they got in the can ready to show it in Barcelona? So I think those are the, they are going to be the problem. Are they going to be allowed to fly into Spain? 
That's true. Yeah. Yeah. You know, even from Europe, are we going to be allowed to fly into Spain? So, you know, because it, it's changing weekly. Well, not quite as bad, but it is. Mark, how many, how many of kind of the, the regular schedule have, have said that they're kind of hoping to, to take place in, in person, I suppose, is, the, is the, the main one at the moment. How many, how many of those have said that they're quite keen to crack on as normal? Most, most of the companies, most of the people I talk to that I see at the show, they would like it to happen. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, there's, there's no two ways about it. They would like it to happen. Um, I think it draws a line in the sand. Once we get one show that does it and goes, then we might be off again. But it's generally people would like it to happen. I think, as Tony says, Joe, um, the ability of people to travel to these shows is the unknown. Um, you know, I I wonder um, whether June for Barcelona is a little too early because I, I do think there'll still be travel restrictions going into Spain. However, CinemaCon in Vegas in August for an American um, attendees would be very interesting. I really think that would be interesting. Yeah. Um, Tony and I are excited about Dubai. Um, we've we've been going to um, Dubai for a number of years. Um, Tony and I were over there together a couple of years ago, and we found. I think Tony, you'd agree. We found that show very interesting. It was really our first look at how people were forming together to support the Saudi market. Yeah, yeah, I'd agree with that. I think I think it, it, the, the progress out there is slowing down a little bit, as I said. Um, a lot of the Middle East is slowed right down. Places like Dubai, Bahrain, uh, Qatar, etc. they're not doing as much work as they were. Um, but Saudi is forging ahead. I mean, they, they it's something like 3,000 screens they want by 2030. Um, so that, that's, a, that's, that's a lot of business. So, it, and they need more companies invested in cinema out there. Um, so we, we'll see what's happening. But of course, places like Cinepolis, who were saying they were going to build 200 screens in there, they've lost their war chest because Mexico's been shut. India's been shut. They haven't got the money to invest in it. AMC's the other big one that's going out there. The only one, <clears throat> the one that is moving forward at the moment is Movie, and that is the only local Saudi Arabia operator. So they have the money to invest. All the others are relying on what they've got in their current cinema chain. So it has changed the, uh, it's changed it a little bit. And I, I think, Joe, if I was a betting man, I think our customers are most likely to see Tony and I stood next to each other in Dubai in October. I think that's my best my best guess at this moment. And we would obviously love to see them and make them as welcome as possible and, you know, build from there. Of course, the, the other thing is, I mean, as Mark said, there's four major shows we do, which is uh, if you start at the beginning of the year, it's Europe, Barcelona, then CinemaCon in Vegas, Show East we generally visit, uh, City Asia and this Dubai show. That's expensive. That's a lot of money to put out for shows, particularly CinemaCon, because we have a lot of people there because CinemaCon is the global show. So. We have people from China, India, Europe, and America at that show. So it's a lot of expense. We haven't been making the money to invest in these shows. So it's going to be, you know, how do we do it? What do we, what presence do we have at these shows? How much do we invest in it? Want to do them, but to what level do you want to do them? You know, we're not, we're not Christie, we're not Barco, not Dolby. So yeah, we've got to, Cut the cloth, so to speak. Is that where kind of these virtual shows can prove to be so valuable, Bark? 
I think while there's no actual shows going on, yes, definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Well, as, as ever, a, an interesting chat about the world of cinema and, and Hartness screens and, and kind of the future that, that we may have. That, that was, yeah, thank you very much for, for hopping on this call, obviously. And it, it was a in, really interesting chat. And I'm sure there's going to be more that people can see on Hartness screens TV that could, you know, kind of tickle their fancy in regards to the world of, of cinema. And thank you very much for watching. I've been Joe Harvey. I've been joined by Mark Ashcroft and Tony Dilley. And I'm sure there'll be another Hartness Screens roundtable soon.